Thanks, Bingo. Hello. Thank you. Um, right, so uh, thank you very much. Um, I hope you're all enjoying yourself up the back. Uh, my name's Laura Jordan Bambach, um, and I am here to talk about a couple of things, uh, but most importantly, the stuff that I do at Mr. President, my amazing agency, all the guys down there. Yay. Um, but even before I do that, I just wanted to ask everyone to put their hands together for my mum and dad, who are in the audience. They've come all the way from Australia, and they've never seen me speak. So um, thank you very much, mum and dad. Um, OK, so I have always been driven by a sense of purpose. This is me in, I don't know, 1995, maybe. Um, on the cover of something called Geek Girl, which is a cyber feminist magazine. Uh, and I've been very, very passionate as a woman who works in design and who works in technology and who is a creative around, uh, I, guess making, I guess, making the world a better place, which is sort of the whole purpose that I feel like I've, uh, I've been put on this earth to do. It's why um, I've been so involved with DNAD. DNAD is an amazing organization, obviously a charity, does incredible things uh, for young design and advertising students all around the world through New Blood. Uh, and we also have the White Pencil, which is an incredible initiative to celebrate uh, pieces of work that have a purpose beyond profit. So working with companies that are trying to do the right thing. It's why I started the Kant Festival. So for those of you in advertising, the Kant the, uh, can is sort of the biggest uh, advertising festival in the world. And Kant is for the people that can't go to Can. Um, and the reason that I started it was because I really realized that I'm, as a creative director and a creative person, very, very fortunate to be able to go every year. But I'm by no means the creator of the amazing work that I get to go and pick up the awards for. It is my team the amazing designers, it's the user experience people, it is the producers, it's the creative technologists, it's the young creatives who actually come up with the ideas that should, uh, should be celebrated, but they never get to go. And Cannes itself is a very elitist, um, elitist week. So uh, the Cannes Festival, you've just missed it, but please come next year. And it's why I also founded She Says nine years ago. So She Says is a global volunteer network uh, and the aim, really, of She Says is to try to get more women into the creative industries because um, really when I came to London 15 years ago, there weren't very many of us out there, and particularly not in digital and particularly not in design or coding or, or sort of anything to do with um, sort of the making of things rather than thinking about things. But when you step back into, I guess, the rest of the world, you realise that even the thinking of things is, is a very kind of masculine world. And that's why I founded Mr. President. So uh, those are my two partners, but actually everyone in the agency owns a bit of the agency. Um, and the purpose of Mr. President is to try to do things in a different way, to create work of value. I know that sounds crazy, but it's actually almost impossible to do in the advertising world. To create stuff of value, to create stuff with purpose, and to leave a legacy in the world with the work that we produce. So I'm going to show you a couple of pieces of work that uh, we produced over the last couple of months. <coughs> so the first one is for The Body Shop. So we're The Body Shop's global creative agency, which is very, very exciting. And we're helping them. I don't know how old you guys are, um, a lot younger than me, I imagine. But The Body Shop used to be the coolest brand in the world. It used to stand for something. It used to be funny. They used to you know, really talk with an activist attitude. Um, and that has all sort of dissipated. And so what we've been hired to do is to try to bring their personality and bring the brand back. So this is the beginning of a long journey, but this is the very first piece of work that we've done for them. 
I wait for the train to go over. Um, I'm going to play a video, but whoever's doing the sound, can you turn it right up, please? Because it's very hard to hear otherwise. Turn it up. Uh, this is probably the least dreadful. Which one of you picked, Dad? I don't know. So much. Hailed it. Let me get the sun. Careful. Yeah, in my hands. Great job, guys. Going back to my head. Oh, boy. In there. That's it. Marvellous. And don't get off me. Yeah. Isn't that lovely? Here we are. Cool. To a perfection. Ah! Cool. Perfect. Ah! Steady. Looking out a little nose. Let's go and see Mummy, shall we? Morning, Harry. Morning, Harry. Or should I say good night? <laughs> Happy Mummy's Day. There are these pinky ones you've got. Polish. Lovely. Bye. Okay, bye for now. first piece of work. Thank you. That's our first piece of work for the body shop. Uh, where that came from though is thinking about you want to treat your mum like a queen. How does, your, how does the queen want to be treated? She wants to be treated like every other mum and trying to find that real human insight about you know what's important to mums is actually those little things like breakfast in bed and having their family around not all those sort of pomp and circumstance that she would normally have. Um, the next piece of work I want to sh share with you is for Grey Goose. Um, so Grey Goose, we, we do quite a lot of work in the, sort of the booze area. We're very lucky in that way. Um, so Grey Goose is a super premium vodka that has been basically trashed. So if you think about the people that drink Grey Goose now, the people that are photographed drinking Grey Goose, it's very sort of towy. It's sort of footballers' wives. And because uh, of social media, and because of the people getting their pictures taken with the vodka, Actually, it means that the real people who they're trying to target, who are these kind of super premium, um, sort of, uh, I guess, sort of the people that buy a Rolex or the people that buy, you know, other expensive brands I don't know about because I'm not that rich, um, they're not drinking Grey Goose anymore. So the piece of work that we did here was actually say that the worst thing you could possibly do is to advertise. Because when you advertise, you talk to this mass market and you get a whole lot of people excited, and actually we want to do something really exclusive. So we produced um, a sterling silver piece of jewelry. It's a beautiful, beautiful piece of jewelry, but it has an NFC chip on the inside. What the NFC chip does is it recognizes you and it recognizes your favorite drink, uh, and it also unlocks a whole lot of cool stuff all over the world. So um, you could walk into uh, a bar in the south of France or you could unlock a changing room in Ibiza in one of the amazing clubs there. You could get into a, like a really amazing private gig. You could go into any of the Soho houses and they'll know you and they'll be able to give you a drink. So it's the beginning of, I guess, creating them a club, but using technology through this really sort of beautiful, lovely trinket um, in order to do it. I'll play the video. The video was actually made for Grey Goose, so you need to excuse some of the really brandy language in here.
about that project is actually obviously working with these beautiful things and making these beautiful things, you kind of want to hold onto them and you want to be part of that club and you know you're not really invited to be part of that club. But we've, you know, sort of scurried a few away in the corners at least so that Mr. P guys can uh, go and see some of this stuff. Um, the next piece of work only launched about two weeks ago. So the other brand, one of the other brands we work for is Bacardi. And they have a bit of an image problem as well. You probably realize that by now. Bacardi is not a very, very cool brand. It's not a cool rum. In fact, most people not, uh, don't think of it as a rum. They think of it as breezes. Um, but they have a really interesting, really uh, edgy history. And they're still a family-owned company. But they did something on, uh, on Halloween last year. And they threw an enormous party in the Bermuda Triangle. So they invited 2,000 of like the coolest people um, to go to the Bermuda Triangle and have an amazing party. There was Calvin Harris playing, there was Ellie Gouldie playing, there was Kendrick Lamar playing. Um, and we wanted to do a piece of work uh, that really excited people around the event, but exciting people around the event by showing them that you weren't cool enough to go to the event is not the right way to talk about a party. So instead, we partnered up with an amazing guy called Marcus Haney. So Marcus Haney is a professional festival breaker in era. Um, he's a young guy, he's from California. He's been on Jay Leno or whatever. He's broken into Glastonbury. He's broken into the, into the Emmys. And he does it in real style with a bunch of friends. He's got a friend in a wheelchair. Um, he's just released a film uh, through MTV called No Cameras Allowed, which has been really successful. So what we did is we got Ellie Goulding on Twitter to challenge him to break into this festival. And then we let him loose. So Bingo was saying, you know, when he was showing the editing about the amount of footage that uh, was shot versus the film that was made, we had 70 hours worth of footage delivered to us. Uh, and from that, we've made a 25 minute documentary. But I'll just play the trailer. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> Marcus Haney. Marcus Haney. Marcus Haney. Did you sneak in here today? Uh, Marcus, you basically made a quasi-career out of sneaking into music festivals. The story that leaves a lasting impression. Now people know what he looks like. Does he plan to continue to do this? I'm gonna get a burrito, no burrito? Burrito. Burrito. So, um, Ellie Goulding challenged me to sneak into this music festival on an island in the Bermuda Triangle somewhere. This is kind of too good to pass up. It's like the best dare ever. I think we need to do it in a way that goes beyond any any measure that we ever stuck in anything before. Ellie Goulding's playing, Kendrick Lamar's playing, Calvin Harris playing. We have no idea where this island is. So check this out, oh, guys. That island right there? That's it. That's it, that's Palomino Island. There's a lot of us and the security is supposedly going to be pretty nuts. It's military. You have the army? Yeah. Uh, boat police. It's a four mile trek across the ocean. I think it's doable. Oh, fucking oh, shit. Oh, yeah. You get caught, you're not going to say nothing about this. We're kind of fucked. <laughs> What happens if you get over there and security bus you swim for it? That's a different ball game for sure. I'm accepting to do a hazardous activity on behalf of the Untitled Marcus Haney Project. I do not hold DNR Productions responsible for any events to occur as a result of this action. Yes! Think it's gonna work? I have no idea. Um, because we could have done something really, really traditional, really conventional. We could have taken that money and done something, you know, quite standard with it. And we had a really brave client, actually, who said, we'll give the cash to this guy with absolutely no uh, idea about what we're going to get back, and we'll just let him loose. And what he delivered us and what we've made is, uh, is really spectacular. He, he did manage to break into the festival, and he broke in dressed as Ellie Goulding, 
um, which you can probably tell. His, uh, his best friend uh, dressed as Ellie's boyfriend, Dougie. And they managed to get backstage and they managed to surprise Ellie Goulding in her dressing room just before she went on stage. So it's a, it's a really good story. It's on Vimeo and it will be coming hopefully to a cinema near you soon. Um, so that's some of the kind of stuff that we do at Mr. President. Some of that stuff, as I was saying, that leaves a legacy and has a, you know, it has a real purpose that connects with people outside of the advertising world, which is sort of the world that we live in with Mr. P. But we have a problem. Um, and if you have a look at the people on stage here, and I know the guys have been trying really, really hard to get women to speak. Um, but why is it that we start out 50-50, men and women, in college, but you don't see, even in those first years of design or in advertising, 50% of women in the industry. Where do we go? Like, where, where do all the women go? Why, are there only 8% of creative directors in the UK. Globally, it's three. In the UK, it's eight. That is absolutely abysmal. And why is that so slow to change? You know, I came here 15 years ago, and to be honest, things haven't moved that much in the 15 years I've been here. And I guess, what can we do about it? So that's the reason that I founded She Says, and this is kind of, I guess really my passion and what I wanted to share with you is a little bit of thinking about maybe how we can change the dial a little bit in your own studios and your own agencies. So there are plenty of organizations doing things. This is just a, a couple of them um, within our industry and within culture. But the problem is really rooted somewhere, you know, way out of design and way out of advertising. It doesn't really belong there. So this is a, this is a study done by the University of Arizona. They took all the data about deaths from hurricanes for the last 60 years in the US, and they took out all the major events like Katrina, and they found that you're twice as likely to die if you, uh, in a hurricane named after a woman than a man, because the hurricanes named after women aren't taken as seriously. Just the fact they're called a woman's name means that people don't, don't uh, leave their homes, they don't board up as much. Um, or something like this, which you probably saw, it happened a couple of weeks ago, the Lionesses came back after coming third in the World Cup, amazing. And FIFA give this tweet, so our Lionesses go back to being mothers, partners and daughters today, but they've taken on another title, heroes. Like since when is it okay just to refer to women in the way that they relate to other people. Like we're human beings, we don't have to be validated by our roles regarding other human beings. Um, so this is my real passion and I, um, I judged the glass line in Cannes this year. And I have to say it was really impactful and very heartwarming and also really horrible to see hundreds and hundreds of videos about genital mutilation, about domestic violence, about the mistreatment of women around the world um, you've all seen this film, I'm sure. I won't play it because uh, I think it's had something like 8.4 billion views, but Hi. like a girl. Okay, and you start so thinking I'm about the things that are sort of inherent in our culture. Uh, since when has it been okay as well to say, oh, you know, God, you're such a girl. You know, it's such, a, such an appalling thing for our sort of, for our culture to say without thinking. Show and it does it such incredible like damage like to women and to girls, particularly when they're going through puberty and they have such low self-esteem. Um, and then this, oh, I want some volume for that one. This piece of work, though, you probably haven't seen. It's from Egypt. Uh, it was a piece of work done uh, for UN women. Um, and when I saw this, I'd, my heart just broke because I couldn't believe that this was an issue. Can you turn it? Turn it up, please. It's more mucky. You guys, 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 Hi, this is Jeremy Bowen from BBC News. 
You're listening to World Have Your Say. The video accompanied with the hashtag My Mother's Name Is has gone viral. Over 1.2 million people have watched and we're heading straight to Egypt to hear a conversation prompted by a video asking men very simply to say their mother's name. After years, I remember mothers forget their names because nobody called them by their name. It's very important to start to give their mother their basic rights. I hadn't noticed it, but, it, you know, once I did, I went round asking people to, to tell me their mum's names. I even used it on Facebook. I said, my mum's name is Mona, what's your mum's name? People started to say their mother's name, and now they know that their mother's name is not only a term or a word that is used to refer to the woman that bear them, but also it's an identity. What this does is starts the conversation from the ground up, which is equally important. It's getting people to think about how we view um, gender, how we view equality. Um, It's starting a broader conversation about the role of men and boys. Uh, Men are embarrassed to mention their mother's name. They'd rather use a a boy's name or a man's name, uh, even if he's not even present physically. So, (laughs) So sometimes I would not even know how to respond. I mean, my brother is not around. Why is someone calling my brother's name? I have a name. They can just use that. Uh, revealing your mother's name would, would get you into trouble. Well, my name is Shahira. They should call me by my name. So when you see this work, you realize it starts to really open your eyes around uh, like a, a couple of really simple things that we need to address here, you know, in London, here in, I don't want to say the Western world, but, you know, here in places where we don't think that this is an issue anymore. Um, things like the, the concept of raw talent is a culturally constructed idea and it has so many variables around it, you know, it has things to do with the confidence of women when they're being talked to, you know, like a girl. Um, it, has, it has things to do with the sort of the opportunities that you get, uh, I guess, as a woman in a society where you, the sexism, sexism is very, very kind of ingrained and very, very hidden. Anyway, uh, what I wanted to show you is when we actually do win, when we do really well and when we get on stage, this happens. Or that. You know, we have a long way to go before we can actually say that this issue is, is ended. And I would say to any of you women in the audience, because I saw it so much in Cannes, um, even if a whole group of women won an award and there was one guy that won the award, the guy would like, run up on stage, he'd grab the award, he'd go to the front, he'd stand here for the cameras, and all the girls would stand around him. And I would say, if you're a woman, just go and grab that fucking award. It's yours. You deserve it as much as the guys. Because we've got to try to change things somehow. So through She Says and through everything that I've sort of seen over the last... 15, 20 years, these are the real issues. So there's a lack of visibility at the top. There's a real issue around confidence. There is still sexist behavior. None of you guys, I'm sure, do it, but it, you know, it is out there, unfortunately. Uh, there's an issue around talking to, uh, about mums and mums issues and not parenting issues. And I, again, I don't know how many of you are parents, but trust me, in like five or 10 years time, that will matter to you. Um, and there is still aggression and bullying out there. So. At Mr. P, one of the other things that we wanted to do in terms of leaving a, le- leave a, le- a legacy is to change that and to really address it head on. So the first thing that we do is we treat everyone like adults. No one's clocked in or out. If you've got to go home, like for your kids, that's fine. If you want to go on an adventure, that's fine. But to really respect the fact that people have other lives outside of work and to not make that a mum's problem. Um, again, not going to... Uh, apply to most of you now, but you will care about it. Equal maternity and paternity pay, not just equal maternity and paternity time off. Because until there's equal pay, it still ends up being the mother's responsibility to look after the child and to take that career break. Um, Collaborative project teams and a really flat structure. uh, I'm a real believer that that kind of really hierarchical, really alpha male way of running a team and running an agency or a studio just is so outdated and doesn't work. And please, I just implore you not to be a dick and to to work with the work with the people that you work with and respect them. (laughs) 
Um, paid internships from day one. Because for some, for some reason as creative people, because we're creative and we love what we do, everyone thinks that we want to work for free, but it's not true. Um, and paid internships, weirdly, really affect women more than men. I don't know whether it, I've not got to the bottom of it yet, whether it's that guys are happier to sleep on people's floors or whatever than, than women, but as soon as women get unpaid internships, they drop out. Um, just mentoring everyone and giving them confidence to be able to succeed in their careers. And finally, and this is something that I want you all to take away, is just a commitment never to stereotype people in your work. If you're doing a piece of design work, if you're putting a piece of work together, think, do I need to use this stereotypically beautiful person or can I use someone else instead? Do I need to use a, uh, like a beautiful white woman or can I use a black woman instead? You know, and it's not just about women, it's actually just about showing a diverse range of human beings in our work. And I think we're all guilty of falling to stereotypes or bending to client wishes but it's so, so important for us to be able to show, like, show people back what, what society and what culture actually has within it. Um, so finally, I just want to say, are you with us? Um, thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry, Mum and Dad. That was 1995.